Welcome to my corner of the internet. I'm the house hacker. Today I wanna to talk to you about safety nets. Last week, we talked about saving and multiple weeks before that, we've addressed investing. This week, I wanna talk about safety nets. And while it's good to have a positive outlook towards the future, you should always expect the worst. And that's why we have safety nets so that you're prepared for the worst thing to happen because Murphy's law is real. But before we get into that, I won't be able to make any videos for the next few weeks because I'll be on vacation. And the way I have my video editing set up, it'll be really challenging for me to edit while I'm traveling. So instead, I'm gonna focus on making more TikToks. So go ahead and follow me on TikTok if you're interested in seeing parts of my adventures. And so let's get into safety nets. I wanna start off by talking about how big your safety net should be. Then let's talk about different ways to store it and the different risk levels associated with those different ways. All right, let's dive right into this. How big should your safety net be? Well, if you ask the experts, the financial experts out there, they'll tell you three to six months. And I'm gonna go ahead and remove that expert. Sure, three to six months is a good rule, but it doesn't customize itself to your needs. So how do you figure out how many months you need for your safety net? Well, the first step is figure out what is your monthly expenses. And that's, and once you figure that out, we're gonna build up iterations of that amount of how many of those we're, you're gonna need. So one of the first questions you need to ask yourself is how many months will it take you to find a new job if you lose your current one? You know, if, it, if, you're, if it's gonna take you six months, then you absolutely will need a minimum of six months and maybe even eight just to be safe. So I'm gonna give you a bit of an edge case to kind of give you an idea of like an extreme of where you don't need much of a safety net. If you're married and you have a partner and both of you guys make enough money and that your costs are low enough that each of your incomes alone could cover all of your costs and then some, and then you also have a side business, which is making about half your monthly costs. I would look at your, your safety net and I would say, you probably don't need more than two months. One month to two months would probably be sufficient. And it just depends on like what your needs are and what your situation is. And honestly, one to two months might be tough for most people to pallet because it's not just about being safe, it's about feeling safe. So. That is why it's good to have multiple months because some people need that feeling of safety. My safety net is about six, six and a half, maybe even seven months. It kind of fluctuates uh, and I have it distributed across different risk tolerances and we'll kind of get, we'll get into that as well. So really focus this in on the most important points. You need to look at how many income streams do you have? And of, the, of those income streams, how much income do they generate relative to the monthly cost that you have. What are the risks that you will lose those income streams? And how long will it take to replace or rebuild them? That's really the equation you're looking at. And based off of that alone, you can determine how many months you need. And then you can look at, well, you might calculate that four months is enough but you might feel that four months isn't enough and adding a couple more months on top of that's okay. What you don't want is to say, I need six months, but I feel like one year's worth of safety net is, is gonna make me feel comfortable. That's too much. Um, it, I mean, it needs to be truly unique uh, of an edge case for you to really look at a one year safety net. I mean, it's really got to be a finicky situation that you're in. Now, when it comes to where you put your safety net, let's start with the lowest risk and move up into higher risk categories. So you can always put your money in a high interest yielding bank account, savings account. Uh, unfortunately, right now, those are only giving in best case scenario around half a percent. So you're gonna really be missing out. Ally Bank is an example of one of these banks that's currently giving half a percent interest rate. They're pretty hard to find, and when you find them, um, the interest rate can fluctuate, and so there's no guarantee that it's gonna be that way in the future. And, and the notice that you get is usually a month, so it's not like you get a very large notice either. Alternatively, there's also Yada Bank, which is a pretty interesting concept. Every single week, they do a lottery drawing 
and the amount of money that you win is different every single week. Now, this is a little bit sporadic. It's difficult to tell like how much we are you going to win overall. And so I actually tracked a lot of that down. And so I got after using it since, you know, 2020, but looking at my return since for, for the totality of 2021, uh, I'm on track to earning 1.4%, which is almost three times better than what the high interest uh, savings accounts are giving. So for that, it's pretty good. Unfortunately, there's some negatives that we need to go over with the auto bank. The first is because it's a lottery, they don't need to actually notify you when they change the odds of winning, which is an indirect way of changing how much interest rate you're returning on this account. The other issue is there's been a consistent move towards limiting uh, winnings and reducing the chance of winning across the board on Yada. So it seems to be heading in the wrong direction on returns, but in terms of the amount of money that it returns, it is still top tier considering the fact that it is FDIC insured, just like a regular bank, and it secures your funds. Finally, a third negative that I'd, I also want to touch on, because I didn't want to forget this, Yada Bank is very rigid and limiting in how you can move your money in and out of it. So you don't want to store too much in there. In fact, I think the, right now, you don't even want to store more than 10,000. And so there, there's, there's a whole lot of issues with it if you try and go over 10,000 between uh, the rigidness of moving your money in and out as well as the limits on your chances of winning because they go down drastically after you put uh, your first dollar after 10,000. That said, I still use Yada Bank myself and I do have $10,000 in it. I'm, I'm not sponsored by Yada Bank. This is just uh, me giving you my honest opinion. Uh, I do have my referral code in the description below if that's something you guys want to sign up for. You can get some money off of that the next product I'd like to talk about that you could store your money in is BlockFi. This is a cryptocurrency brokerage. Unlike other brokerages for cryptocurrencies, BlockFi pays an interest rate on the cryptocurrency that you hold with them. And what's interesting is that they have a bunch of stable coins. And so stable coins are cryptocurrencies that are pegged to the US dollar. And so if the US dollar moves up, so do they. And so they stay even with the US dollar in valuation. You know, 5,000 USDC, which is a, a cryptocurrency, is equal to 5,000 US dollars, and that's expected to go into the future. BlockFi will pay you 8.25% interest rate on multiple different stable coins for you to pick from. And so it's, it's a good idea to diversify on this to mitigate your, your risk because it's not unheard of for cryptos to fall apart, but it's a good opportunity for you to maximize the returns of your safety net so it's not just sitting in the bank and wasting money, but you are taking a little bit more of a risk because there is a possibility of failure of, of, the, of the crypto failing. And like all things crypto, it's not regulated and it's not FDIC insured, which adds another layer of risk. Um, but I do have money in, in BlockFi uh, I've moved more money there, so my actual crypto holdings has increased, but it hasn't increased for the purpose of crypto holdings. It's actually increased because I moved a portion of my safety net into crypto. And in fact, in BlockFi, I moved 15,000 of my safety net into those two, into two different stable coins, the Gemini and the USDC. I know it's, there's risks there. I'm accepting the risk, but 8.25% interest rate and I think the risk is low enough that I think it's an acceptable uh, exchange and trade. And finally, I wanna talk about our high risk place to put your, your safety net. And this one, I don't recommend putting a whole lot of money in it. Uh, there is a great deal of risk doing this. There's a brokerage called Voyager and they have a similar system like BlockFi. They give you an interest rate on the cryptocurrencies that you hold with them. In fact, they pay a higher amount an interest rate than BlockFi does. They have a crypto called Polkadot that they're currently paying 12% interest rate on. I, I'm gonna be honest, I don't understand where that, how that works. Uh, and generally when you don't understand something like this, it's unwise to go into it. So I did not put a substantial amount. I just threw a little bit of money into Polkadot, but um, there, there's, there's multiple layers of risk. The first layer is that Polkadot is not a stable coin. 
Polkadot is, is a regular cryptocurrency. It's going to go up and down in value. So it's almost like you're buying a stock. And 12% uh, interest rate comes also with a large inflation rate from that cryptocurrency. So there's also risk from that. Polkadot is also not one of the big cryptocurrencies which are, are well known and safer investments. So there's a lot of risks there. Uh, it's not entirely clear, but it's wise in general to diversify, especially since these brokerages are not FDIC insured, they're not really regulated. So the best way to really manage your situation with when it comes to these things is to diversify across multiple uh, brokerages and multiple cryptos. Uh, and, and that is probably the best way to hold your money. I'll throw my referral link in the description below if you guys want to get 10 or $20. I don't remember how much it is. Uh, again, not, not a sponsored video. These are just my thoughts. And these are things that I actually use myself. So I'm not going to recommend something that I don't personally use. It's good to be diversified in general. Those are my thoughts on safety nets. If you like the video, tenderly press the like button so they can feel safe. Then hit the subscribe button and comment below. Let me know how you guys store your safety net. Share the video. Thanks for watching. I'll see you guys on the next one, which will be in a few weeks.